mathematical models are ways that you can describe different systems of humans, of animals, of viruses, particles, anything that um, has some sort of, um, that have interactions. Uh, and so you can use math to describe those interactions. You can describe humans interacting with the environment, um, humans interacting with their dogs, um, all sorts of things. And so in terms of infectious diseases, we can um, build mathematical models that combine humans, uh, that combine the dynamics of the viruses. Um, and so by putting those together, by describing um, the, those systems, those interactions through, through equations, through parameters, all of those sorts of fun math things, we can describe what we think may happen. We can describe what we think happened in the past. So they can be really powerful tools for um, thinking about how to prepare for infectious disease outbreaks um, or uh, how to make them less severe. We use mathematical models to describe the spread of infectious diseases by breaking the population into susceptible, infectious, and recovered. And with a certain probability, you can estimate how many people can be infected, how many people can die, how many people can recover. And all of this can be described with, us, with mathematical formulas and you can understand not only how diseases spread, but also the impact of mitigation strategies such as vaccines, um, school closures, quarantine, isolation. You can measure how many people you can uh, vaccinate in order to reduce the, the spread by a certain percentage. And so that's how we use mathematical models. We use different data streams to understand infectious diseases from satellite imagery to social media. And all of these different data sources, they help us understand different aspects of disease dynamics. For example, ideally we would like to know where mosquitoes are so that we can understand dengue or malaria spread in Brazil or in other parts of the world. But we don't really have a lot of information on mosquitoes because it's very hard to collect uh, information about them. And so what we do is we use satellite imagery to see how green certain areas are. And if, if you see a lot of greenery, then that means that you probably had a lot of rain. And if you had a lot of rain, then you probably had water and you need water to, um, for mosquitoes to reproduce. And so that's how we're using satellite imagery. We measure vegetation, we measure water, and uh, we measure also uh, urban, populations and many other different things so that we can understand how diseases spread. Another data source that we use is social media and that's just because people like to share when they're sick, if they have a fever. Um, they also like to share it if they're uh, wearing a face mask and so you see a lot of people taking s selfies with their face mask. So we use social media to understand behaviors and also to understand how diseases are spreading in a population because most people now self-diagnose and so they go online and they find information about dengue, about treatments, and they can, you know, just go to the, the I mean, go to a pharmacy and buy uh, treatments for, for something that they think they may have. So the, um, the sequence of a virus is the, the um, combination of specific letters or nucleotides um, that, that make it up. And so these are, um, these are the a, uh, DNA nucleotides, A, T, C, G, and those, those compose all of life. Um, uh, but for, for viruses, they can be actually really important sources of information. Um, by looking at that exact sequence uh, here in Brazil versus sequences in Italy, they made connections that that person um, those people came from Italy. Um, and so then as you start to have more transmission in a given location and you start extracting more sequences, you can uh, kind of do some investigation. You can figure out that these two infections were linked together and then that they came from a certain location. Um, so in some ways they help you establish how many different importations you might have in a given location. Um, how different out, uh, how different infections are related to each other, um, and so they're a really good um, investigative tool. 
obviously the more information we have about a disease, the better the model is going to be. Uh, and there's another piece too that if um, we have funding for researchers to start models early before we know what's happening, then they're kind of ready to go, right? But if you ask someone today, can I have a model tomorrow for something they've never done before? That's, that's challenging, right? So there's two pieces. One is keeping researchers around who know how to make good models and who have some things ready to go. And then the other piece of it is understanding the pathogen itself and aspects of it spread, like how long is the incubation period? How long are people infectious? How infectious is it? These kind of questions are hard to answer. So for coronavirus, we're starting to get some more answers about those things. Initially, we really had no idea. When we have no idea, we try to choose some viruses that maybe we think are similar and use that as a starting place. And then as we get more data and more understanding, we can zoom in on the correct parameters for the model. Whenever we have a new disease that we haven't seen before, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen with it, we don't know how bad it's going to be, and so that's always a big deal. And I think with this coronavirus in particular, it seems to be more infectious than the previous ones like SARS or MERS um, that have also been issues in the past. However, it also appears to be less deadly than those two. So it's kind of a different mixture of factors. And um, so I think that's part of the issue is that we just don't know a lot of things. And that makes it, you know, kind of uh, maybe a little bit scary or a little bit uncertain in terms of what to expect. We have seen in recent years a lot of different diseases that have been emerging such as Zika, Chikungunya, Ebola in Africa and uh, coronavirus. As humans interact more with animals, animals usually tend to have different diseases and those diseases are jumping into human populations and so what we're trying to learn is how we, we need to keep our distances from, from animals so that we don't bring those diseases into human populations. And so um, that's one thing that climate change is probably gonna contribute to because, and also just globalization and as cities start to grow, more people start invading areas that were meant to be used for uh, animals like bats and, um, and, other, and other types of animals. And so we need to make sure that we are protecting those areas and not invading them. And in terms of containment, um, we use a lot of different mitigation strategies to contain uh, newly emerging diseases. For new emerging diseases, usually we don't have a treatment or we don't have a vaccine. So we use a lot of behavior change, such as hand washing, uh, face masks for mosquito diseases and a lot of mosquito repellent, bed nets, and so people just need to understand that they need to protect themselves and protect uh, their environment so that they don't get infected. So one of the things that could really help public health workers across the world mitigate infectious disease spread is if we understand when and where those diseases are going to come up. So one of our big goals um, is to be able to have a forecasting system for infectious disease very similar to what we currently have for weather. So that way we can say, hey, this flu season is going to be bad, we're expecting more cases, and people can respond in real time to that. Um, but in order to do that, we need researchers who are, who are able to model, and we also need data to be coming freely um, from different governments and organizations that understand how these cases spread. I think um, what's important to know at this point is uh, how it's transmitted and so therefore you can protect yourselves and you can protect those um, around you. So understanding how how it spreads, it, it's respiratory, it's it's like other um, diseases we see like the flu, so you, you get it when you cough um, or when somebody else coughs in your face and um, or it, it touching surfaces, but it's not spread through blood or mosquitoes. Um, it's not spread through sexual contact, any of those things that we know of right now. The other thing that I think is important is to understand uh, who's most at risk. And it seems like right now that the elderly are those who are most at risk and, and we need to uh, do our part to try and protect them. Um, so in terms of combating misinformation, 
Uh, I think mm, trying to remain calm and rational and not get caught up in, in the hype is um, important. And, and to do that, uh, seek out valid sources of information like government uh, health of websites and, and such. Right now, from what we know, coronavirus is, kind of, is an upper respiratory disease. And in general, those spread two ways. One is through particles in the air. So if I have coronavirus and I cough next to you, those particles are in the air. If you breathe them in, it's possible that you could become infected. Um, the other way that it can probably spread is if I touch my nose and face, touch some surface, and then someone else touches that same surface because most likely the virus can last on surfaces for some amount of time, some hours. So the other piece of that is if you do touch things, wash your hands a lot, try not to touch your face. It's interesting how much we touch our faces. You don't notice it until you're thinking about it. So the key take home message is try not to touch your face, wash your hands a lot. And if you are coughing, cough into your arm, cough into a tissue and try to make sure you're not spreading the virus particles everywhere. One of the first things that I would recommend is for people to use official sources. So going to the Ministry of Health um, website, going to the, the World Health Organization, the WHO website, um, going to different ministries of health uh, uh, around the globe. You can, because those are official information uh, websites that provide you know, re relevant and reliable information and people should not be relying on articles on Facebook or on other or on Twitter or on other social media that may you don't really know the source and and so I think I would recommend a regular person just to rely on official data sources and if they see something that um, seems fishy don't share it and you know sometimes people like to share you know very questionable uh, websites and so I would rec I would highly suggest that people don't share uh, information. In fact, the, in Brazil, the Ministry of Health, they have a specific website for fake news. And so people should check that website whenever they, um, they have questions about something that is spreading in their social networks, to just go there and check and make sure that that information is reliable. Mm -hmm.